That's a, like, I, think, I don't think this thing is working, is it? Or, oh, it is. Okay. Um, okay. Welcome everybody to this first uh, or to this macroeconomic session, the first one of the day, at least. Um, the first one to present is uh, Giovanni Melina, stylized facts on business cycles on sub-Saharan Africa. Although I think the title has changed a bit. Uh, then, secondly, we have Marina Mendes Davares with uh, S emissions and growth, who is to blame and who, how to improve. And then finally, I'll be uh, presenting something on um, evaluating the impact of IMF programs um, in uh, mostly in, in African countries, actually. So I'll first give the floor to, uh, to Giovanni. Uh, so you've got 15 minutes. And with five minutes to go, I'll give you a yellow card. And with two minutes to go, uh, the red card. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, as Tim said, the title has slightly, uh, slightly changed, Economic Fluctuations in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and this is um, joint work with uh, Rafael Portillo. Uh, this paper is actually a chapter on, of a book on monetary policy in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, it uses a very simple approach, um, a set of descriptive statistics to uh, define uh, some uh, structural features and also um, business cycle fluctuations in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And so we hope that this can be both interesting per se, but also uh, useful to researchers who have to build theoretical models on uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and especially in the field of monetary policy. Um, so the main aim of this paper is uh, twofold. Uh, we, have, we want to build an overview of some of the structural features of these economies. And then a systematic characterization of economic fluctuations in the regions. Um, and for both set of issues, we compare evidence for sub-Saharan Africa with data from advanced emerging market economies and also other low and lower income, um, lower middle income countries located in other areas of the world. Um, especially in the business cycle part of, um, of this paper, um, there is a relation to a very big literature in macroeconomics, and there is actually a long-standing tradition in modern macro that um, goes back to the pioneering work of uh, Prescott. And uh, there are some papers also, especially on emerging market economies that uh, build business cycle facts for selected emerging markets. But as far as we know, there is no such a systematic analysis for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, nor an analysis that compares uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to the rest of the world from this macro uh, perspective. So we're, I'm going to go through some uh, data. Uh, then I'll be selective in the issues I will present uh, because of time constraints. And I will present some of the structural features, um, an overview of some methodological issues, business cycle dynamics, and then, and, and then I will conclude. So data. Um, the data we use are all publicly available. It's basically the databases of the IMF, the OECD, the World Bank. We focus on um, most of our statistics are built over a sample between 1960 and 2007. We exclude the global financial crisis and the Great Recessions uh, because we thought um, we could not really build uh, stylized facts out of that because it was sort of exceptional circumstances. We also exclude small states because of their uh, peculiarities in terms of macro how they are affected by macroeconomic shocks. And we exclude countries with less than 30 years of an interrupted data series, um, especially because we, uh, when it comes to computing trends, and then we exclude also South Africa uh, because of its emerging market status, its level of income that sets it apart from um, most of the region. So once we do all that, we remain with um, 31 countries when it comes to Sub-Saharan Africa. I think it's a good number given that the region comprises 45 countries if we exclude South Africa. And then we compare uh, issues. Um, we divide this group into two subgroups. Uh, resource abundant and non-resource abundant. And we will see that for certain issues, this actually matter. 
And then for um, uh, non-Sub-Saharan Africa, um, we divide countries into high income, upper middle income, and uh, low and lower middle income countries. So as it is well known, Sub-Saharan African countries are poor, uh, but what was striking also is that uh, when we compare GDP per capita and also um, uh, GNI per capita, uh, those are, poor, are poorer compared also to low and lower middle income countries uh, located in the rest of the world. And the main reason why this is so is because uh, they fail to converge uh, in terms of real growth rates of uh, per capita GDP, uh, both when we look at the full sample, but also in the more recent sample where it is well known that these countries grew at a higher rate, but still they grew at a lower rate when we compare them to um, low and lower middle income countries located in um, other areas of the world. Um, uh, if we decompose GDP um, first on the supply side, um, uh, um, of course, um, we find the dominance of the agricultural sector, and uh, um, especially in non-resource abundant uh, countries, uh, industry is, uh, has the lowest share of GDP compared to all the other groups. If we decompose GDP um, from the demand uh, side, then these countries have the highest share of private consumption and also the lowest share of, uh, of investment, especially when it comes to non-resource abundant uh, countries. Uh, from a pure growth theory uh, perspective, this may, be, may sound striking because uh, although they are very poor, uh, they, did, they did not converge and so they, they did not invest um, uh, as we would have expected. And uh, the, the most plausible explanation for this is uh, perhaps that that uh, these countries are close to the subsistence level, and so uh, they cannot. Uh, uh, they are forced to consume um, a higher percent percentage of income than they would have otherwise. Um, Another, another uh, issues that sets these uh, countries apart from the rest of the world is that they uh, persistently run trade deficits. Um, in, uh, um, if we look at the high income countries and upper middle income countries, we see that on average they run a trade balance that is um, uh, close to zero or slightly positive. For these countries, almost in the entire distribution of countries, we find a persistent uh, trade deficit. And um, one of the explanation for this is that these countries rely on aid and remittances, and so they can uh, basically have uh, persistently higher exports than, than their imports. Um, they are still financially underdeveloped, and uh, uh, if, we, if, if we look at uh, domestic credit to private sector, which is um, basically the most widely used indicator for uh, uh, financial sector development, um, what, what is striking is not only that uh, the uh, difference compared to upper middle income countries is about 30% uh, of GDP, but also that there is a difference of 20% of GDP when we compare them to uh, low and lower middle income countries in other parts of the world. And uh, if we look at the, uh, their uh, capital account openness, um, and in particular, uh, we look at the de jure capital account openness indicator by Schindler and then extended by Fernandez uh, more recently, um, um, what we found really um, um, striking is that there is a stark difference in the, in the capital account uh, openness among resource abundant countries versus non-resource abundant countries. So uh, non-resource abundant countries have some of the closest capital account uh, in the world, while resource abundant countries have capital accounts that are pretty open. And, uh, and this is likely due uh, to the fact that these countries, from a legislative point of view, had to liberalize their cap capital account uh, in order to attract investment in the mining sector. 
So when it comes to business cycle, um, business cycle um, uh, statistics, uh, we inevitably bump into some methodological issues. In the emerging market literature, there is um, a debate on whether uh, economic fluctuations are the results of, of shocks to economic trends or growth rate. Uh, for example, there is the famous paper by Aguirre Gupina, I think the JPE, um, who find that, um, who basically argue that uh, the trend is the cycle or whether um, business cycles are basically temporary deviations around a more or less deterministic path. And um, so what, in, uh, in this debate, uh, I mean, there is not a clear answer. All these authors are good, have good uh, reasons to argue what they argue. Um, here, we do not try to take a stance on this debate. We basically build results and we, we seek for results that are robust to both uh, kind of approaches. So we basically both detrend the data um, uh, um, using common H HP filter and bandpass filter, which basically assume a deterministic trend. And also we first difference the data, and that basically assumes that um, the prevalent shocks are, are shocks to trends. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is characterized by very large macroeconomic volatility. When we, um, when we look at the standard deviation of output um, and across various uh, different trending methods, we find that results vary con uh, considerably. But from a qualitative point of view, uh, we basically uh, consistently found, find that sub-Saharan African countries have more volatile GDP compared to, uh, to the rest of the world and also 1.5 times more volatile uh, than other low and lower middle income countries located in other areas of the world. Uh, volatility has decreased across the board uh, over time. However, still, uh, these countries are more volatile than the rest of the world, even in the smaller sample. When it comes to the autocorrelation coefficient, uh, what we find is that uh, um, business cycle fluctuations are shorter lived in sub-Saharan Africa um, with respect to, uh, to other countries. So there are basically what we, um, what we conclude from uh, looking at this table is first that these countries are hit by large shocks, two that there are, uh, there are no, not enough mechanisms to uh, absorb the negative effects of these shocks, um, and uh, uh, three that maybe these shocks may be uh, shorter lived or that there, um, in this region there are less real rigidities that make this, uh, uh, this shock more persistent in their uh, transmission mechanism, or simply that data is noisy and, and hence, given that the, uh, the measurement error is white noise, uh, this by construction will decrease the autocorrelation coefficient. Um, Many people in the literature, in the macroeconomic literature, uh, have found that when we correlate output fluctuations with inflation, we find a nice negative relationship with per capita GDP. In the sense that uh, inflation and output are positively correlated in uh, advanced economies, then, and then the correlation declines and turns negative when we, go to, um, when we go to poorer economies and low income countries. What we found uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa that basically all of our countries have um, displayed this negative correlation between uh, output and inflation. And uh, this can be an indication of the prevalence of uh, aggregate supply shock. And uh, this is also in agreement with the fact that the agricultural sector is the, is the biggest, uh, on average, the biggest sector uh, in these economies. And so weather shocks, agricultural shocks are more prevalent. And this makes prices and output uh, move in opposite direction. Um, trade balances are also um, um, are, uh, largely acyclical, and, uh, and, and, and this is also in, contra in contrast with the rest of the world, because in the rest of the world, trade balances are typically uh, counter-cyclical. Um, so this is also, this can be basically uh, the outcome of, uh, um, uh, of the 
um, constraints and uh, uh, financial constraints that these countries have in accessing international financial markets and the fact that in the face of negative shocks they cannot uh, they cannot resort to uh, borrowing interna internationally in order to smooth consumption. Um, pretty much um, in all um, advanced economies, when we uh, compare the volatility of consumption and output, we find that are uh, more or less as volatile. Uh, when, uh, when we go down the income ladder, what we find is that typically consumption tends to be more volatile than, than output. This is, even more, this is even more so when we look at Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and this is true for investment also. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, but what perhaps sets more these countries apart is the uh, is uh, f first the lack of cyclicality of uh, uh, consumption and investment with respect to output. Uh, and we see that um, one of the defining features of business cycles in high income countries, so in advanced economies, is actually the fact that investment cons and consumption are both uh, very pro-cyclical. And in sub-Saharan Africa, especially when it comes to investment, we see that this correlation is much weaker. But um, results becomes even starker if we correlate uh, consumption and investment per se, um, consumption and, and private, uh, sorry, private consumption and investment, where actually this correlation almost disappears and turns even negative when we, when we uh, look at non-resource uh, non uh, abundant countries. The um, co-movement between inf uh, uh, investment and consumption is actually one of the defining features of the real business cycle theory. Uh, because basically uh, it's the outcome of the fact that there is a, a, a common factor that drives um, the main macroeconomic variables. However, the, the, the absence of these correlations and so the, the lack of this co-movement, so it's basically an indication that a real business cycle in a standard sense may be missing in this particular region. And the fact that there are sector-specific shocks that affect households or firms that are not dissipated through other uh, sectors of the economy, but basically they remi remain confined in the sectors where they arise. Um, so to conclude, uh, we can say that um, this overview, in, in the paper we find, uh, we, we report uh, many more things, but here I, uh, I just presented just a sample of this. Um, so although socioeconomic conditions have improved over time in these countries, Sub-Saharan Africa did not catch up and it is still uh, relatively poorer compared to uh, other low and lower uh, income countries uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, economies are still dominated by agriculture and, I find, and are financially underdeveloped and this has uh, um, strong implications for business cycle fluctuations have, as we have seen. Uh, there is large macroeconomic volatility uh, due to big shocks and absence of mechanisms that absorb these shocks. The, the negative correlation between output inflation is likely to dominance, uh, likely due to dominance of supply shocks. And the fact and the lack of movement between consumption and investment uh, with one another and with output is likely due to the absence of a common factor driving, uh, driving the real business cycle in this region. And this has strong implications when it comes to building models, um, uh, real business cycle models or new Keynesian models for, the, uh, for, for, this, uh, for, uh, for these countries because basi one basic assumption um, at the core of this model uh, fails to be satisfied. Thank you very much. I'm off the discussion for this paper. Uh, just one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, for your presentation and the uh, and the paper. Um, very briefly on the paper, I think it's a great documentation of facts in an under-researched region and it establishes useful things about, uh, about business cycles in, uh, in Africa. 
Um, the key finding, if I had to summarize it in, in, in one line, is that um, one of the key findings is that time series in sub-Saharan Africa are very volatile. Um, and there is good evidence that such volatility obstructs growth, so there could be a causal relationship between two of the things you, you document, for example, the famous uh, Remy and Remy paper from the mid-90s. And when it comes to consumption volatility, there's uh, good theoretical reasons to, uh, to uh, believe that this harms welfare, especially when agents are, uh, are risk-averse. And I think that these kind of things could be maybe used a little bit better to, um, to motivate the paper a little, uh, a little stronger. Um, the same for your very interesting analyses on the uh, cyclicality of the correlation between inflation and output. I think that's a new point that I wasn't aware of. Um, the cyclicality of the trade balance, what does it mean? What could it imply? What could drive it? Is it a problem? Um, and the same for the, for the terms of trade, uh, which is also um, documented in the paper. But relating to the sort of the Ramey Ramey point on the relationship between volatility and growth, um, there's always, I think, one issue that's a bit unsettled, at least in, in my mind, uh, which is that, well, is the volatility in sub Saharan Africa <clears throat> intrinsically higher, or is it basically due to the fact that data quality is just, is just lower there? And, um, working with, with, with economic statistics when, when trying to, to, to make economic statistics when data are scarce is just uh, a difficult task and, and data revisions I think do tend to be bigger in um, maybe the more agricultural based, uh, based economies. And I, I'm wondering whether there's a little bit more what you can say about, about that point. So is the volatility intrinsically higher or is it lower data quality and greater measurement error? And for this the filtering that you've already done could be, uh, could be informative. Particularly, you can, can configure a bandpass filter in a way that it sort of filters out. So all filters, basically, that we apply for economic time series take out the low-frequency component, the trend, either deterministic or stochastic. Uh, the AP, HP filter does that, the first difference filter does it, and the bandpass filter does it. Um, but the bandpass filter also allows you to cut off the noise component of the, um, of the time series, while the first difference filter actually amplifies the noise. So, uh, if there's noise present, it should mostly show up in your first difference filter time series as opposed to the bandpass filtered ones. So this is a, a paper that sort of uh, makes that point by Larry Cristiano and, and Walter and Han. Uh, so what you see here is like the, the gain uh, of it. It's a long time since I uh, did spectral analysis, but I, what I remember from, so this is the gain of a filter. So you see that all filters have a gain of zero at low frequencies. So this is where the trend is, is located. So all filters take out the trend. But they behave very differently uh, when you look at the higher frequencies. So business cycle frequencies somewhere, live somewhere here in the middle, while the noise really lives up here at the, at the higher end. And you see that the first difference filter actually amplifies the noise. Um, an HP filter, that's the black line here, um, uh, basically leaves the noise intact up to a certain factor, while you can configure a bandpass filter. I'm not sure about the Christiana Fitzgerald version that you've used, but you can f configure a bandpass filter in principle to um, take out, to, to assign a gain of zero to frequencies where the, uh, where the noise lives, which should be able to maybe tell you a little bit more about uh, the point on the intrinsic volatility versus, versus data quality, especially by comparing it to the first different difference filter with which uh, tends to amplify the noise. Uh, but all in all, I think it's a very nice contribution to um, a certain under-researched region with some, some novel and potentially important results on the importance of supply shocks and these, um, and, these kind of, uh, and these kind of issues. So with that, I conclude my brief discussion and uh, would like to hand uh, the floor to uh, the audience for questions and comments. Should they reply first? Or? Um, yeah, well, you, you, okay. yeah, okay, feel free okay. if you like. <laughs> okay. Yeah, over there. Oh. Uh, thank you. I enjoyed that uh, presentation. And just a couple of um, uh, observations on this. That um, I recall reading the, the Pritchard paper um, when it came out, and, and he has this very nice quote at the beginning that says, almost everything that we think is true about trends and cycles is completely absent when we look at um, uh, developing countries. So the idea that there's a smooth, smooth trend of regular cycles uh, informs a lot of our thinking um, about the evolution of uh, data. And I thought 
one of the problems about going straight to a kind of a filtering uh, approach, even though you're sensitive to the properties of alternative fil filters, is that we don't really get a, a good picture of the, uh, the dynamics of, of, of output. I have a, a more visual picture. And what I was thinking about is something like a, an MBR type of dating uh, mechanism or something non-parametric that looks at, at the patterns in terms of um, uh, the dating of cycles, their amplitude, the, um, the, the kind of uh, peak to trough range that, that might be a sort of a preliminary uh, non-parametric description of, uh, of um, uh, at least the output cycles um, as a complement to what you've, you've done. The second issue is when you, you do some analysis uh, of these um, cycles, uh, everything assumes a, a, a symmetry here, that um, positive shocks and negative shocks. And, and one of the things about uh, the nature of the incomplete, incomplete markets that we, we think are, are driving a lot of the results here, the, uh, the nature of supply shocks in, in agriculture, the absence of credit markets, et cetera, might lead you to think there's very powerful asymmetries in, in behavior um, in terms of the relationship. And you, you point at one important one, the, the inflation output one. But I, I think just when you looked at the correlations between consumption and investment, for example, it might be quite interesting to explore that a little further, looking at uh, that behavior over, in an asymmetric sense over positive shocks and negative. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, I like the fact that uh, you divided uh, countries structurally, like resource uh, 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 abundant and non resource abundant countries. But uh, even within uh, the cluster of resource abundant and non resource abundant, you would see significant heterogeneities. For example, I can't expect. Uh, Botswana and uh, DRC uh, or uh, Zambia or other countries to behave similarly. So it would be nice if you would also do the same analysis uh, across uh, level of development uh, and other things. Uh, in addition, um, uh, apart from just uh, describing uh, the business cycle uh, process in general, it would be nice if you would uh, focus specifically uh, on the sources of these shocks, like uh, with respect to uh, 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 trade, uh, um, commodity prices, uh, credit supply, or productivity, uh, these kind of things. Thank you. Cinder? Okay. Um. I have uh, just a few comments on the methodology and uh, maybe the, the motivation of the paper. So basically, um, I show the concern uh, Chris raised uh, previously about the cycles and uh, the trends. Um, so why business cycle is important for low-income developing countries, I think um, maybe there will be something more to say in the beginning because uh, if everything is related to the trend rather than a cycle, so maybe trend will be the first order. Um, on the other hand, there's one claim you made about the consumption volatility may be welfare, um, welfare reducing. And that's generally true for a business cycle discussion. So if uh, the consumption volatility is defined as a fluctuation around the, um, a trend, so that's okay. But uh, for developing countries, if uh, consumption volatility or consumption movement is largely due to a technology shock or TF around the trend, so you cannot distinguish two from each other using a standard HP filter methodology. So if that's, that's the main movement, uh, drive the consumption. Um, it's very difficult to say your conclusion will be the, you know, will be the main one. Um, there have been papers uh, by, you know, um, by Kruger mentioned that as well. And I have some other papers I can share with you on this literature as well. Like, yeah. Find the question at the back. Uh, Michael Blini, University of Nottingham. 
Um, yeah, I agree with your point about agricultural shocks, um, as well as the, I take the discussant's point about um, data problems. But I sort of have the impression that agricultural climatic shocks are more important in Africa than, say, Bangladesh or somewhere, other low-income countries. Uh, it might be interesting to try and test that, whether the fact that agriculture is important in Africa may have a bigger effect on uh, fluctuations than it does in other low-income countries. Would you be okay if we do the comments, if you'd like to respond bilaterally, or because we sort of ran out of time? Uh, are, are there, are there uh, urgent, urgent things you'd like to respond to here? I mean, I, it will take me a minute, so... Okay, okay, please go. What, what is that? Okay, please, please keep it brief, because we're I over promise. time. I promise. It was a quick question. I just <laughs> want to know if it's possible for you to compare the current, your current data set, say 97, uh, on in sub-Saharan Africa with um, the low and lower middle income countries that you have in your data set today, but say 30 years back, when their income was more similar to sub-Saharan Africa. Right, yeah, okay. Um, how do I So, yeah, please respond. How do I? Oh, I think it's what's on, it's on. Ah, okay, it's on. Um, yeah, for sure, uh, I think that the uh, the issue that you mentioned about volatility and growth, the relationship between volatility and growth, is actually something that we somehow find in the paper, in the sense that in the, in the more recent sample, when, uh, when we have higher growth, we also have high, lower volatility. Okay. So I think that also making this point in the paper would be actually uh, very good, and we, we, we will. We will link it to the Remy and Remy uh, paper, as you suggested. Uh, when it comes to data quality, yes, you're right. Uh, you know, it is always an issue, but at uh, at a certain point, we have to use the data we have, mm -hmm. and uh, and I mean, otherwise, we would not produce any um, any research on that when it comes to especially to uh, business cycle regularities. Um, for trend of, trend versus cycle, uh, actually, what we um, what we do is although we do not take a stance on that, but um, um, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, we look for uh, stylized facts that are robust to that. So we don't, we not only use the HP filter or any other filter to. Um, uh, to look at um, uh, cyclical deviations of macroeconomic variables, but also we look at growth rates. And so uh, the, um, most of the issues that uh, I presented um, here are robust to uh, other types of the, of the, the trending, uh, including growth rates, which actually assume that, um, assume that uh, implicitly that uh, shocks to trends are more important than uh, um, uh, than uh, than cyclical deviations, and um, uh, in terms of uh, yeah, uh, looking at amplitudes and other types of uh, non-parametric um, non-parametric statistics about this, but wouldn't that entail uh, detrending the variable first? Uh, so wouldn't that, uh, would uh, I think that we would incur still in the same problem of having to the trend right first in order to 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 to, to compute this statistic or not? Yeah. Okay. That's I think fine. we need to uh, to, okay. move, to move on to the uh, to the next page. Over and uh, thank you. Already. Okay. Um, okay. So no, Marina, no, no, please no, take the uh, please take the floor. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. So now we're going to move a little bit the gears, but we're going to still touch issues about uh, uh, structural transformation and the importance of the composition of this economy. But I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, uh, climate. So here this is a very simple decomposition, just to try to make it the, the point of the paper. We can decompose emissions between output uh, between and uh, energy use divided by output that we call energy intensity and uh, between total emissions by energy use. So we want countries to grow, so we don't want outputs to go down. So if we want to decrease emissions, we can do it through reducing energy intensity 
So improving how much energy is used to produce output or we can do to using resources or energy that is cleaner through to renewable resources. In this paper, we are going to be focused on energy intensity. So just to give an idea about the, what is the importance of energy intensity, we are going to plug here in the X axis energy use per PPP GDP, so a measure of energy intensity, and the Y axis CO2 emission. And we, what we observe here is that there is a very strong uh, positive uh, correlation between your level of energy use per PPP GDP, per PPP GDP and the, how much you emit of CO2. It's true that there is deviations across, and the deviations is mostly sometimes due for the type of energy that you use. If you use more resource energy, or if you use more uh, energy that are more dirty, like cold. So now we, our focus is going to be on energy intensity. So in this paper, we want to answer like three questions. One is, how does energy intensity differ across countries so across the level of development? Second, which factors account for energy, these differences, energy intensity that we observe in the data is due to differences in the structure of this economy? So what would happen when there is more structural transformation? Is due to differences in prices or is due to differences in the productivity of energy? And then we are going to touch on policy implications. So since this is a brief and presentation, let's just to give a little bit about our findings. So we find that energy intensity has a hump shape. I'm going to discuss a little bit about this hump shape. And uh, so countries that have a very low level of development, they use very, ener very little energy to produce output. As they develop more, more energy is used. And as you get very, very developed and you're a rich country, you use less energy to produce the same amount of output. You're more efficient. Which factors account? We're going to touch on two things that are important. One, that it's related to technology that uh, in transforming energy to output, but also the sectoral composition is important because the agricultural sector and the services sector, per nature, are sectors that involve less energy use. So as the countries move and develop and pass to structural transformation, there's something natural that makes them to be more, more efficient. And then I'm going to focus and I'm going to talk a lot about the industrial sector and the composition of this sector, why this sector is key to understand differences in energy intensity across country. And, uh, and I'm going to talk that prices are not as important, but, uh, but technology is. And let's, uh, if I have time, I'm going to just say that, uh, uh, that there is some technology that can, can be improved. So let's go to the paper. So we are not the first one to be talking about this. There is a very large lit literature. And our contribution is that we are looking for a broad set of countries, including low, middle, and high income countries. And I'm going to be focused in using the growth account framework that we have using in developing economics for years, now to be looking as well on energy. So the data, if you, if you want to work on that, uh, we use a lot of data from the International Energy Agency. This is going to be the data that's going to give us data on the sector use of energy per sector in 100 countries. We are going to use uh, data from the house, from the IMF, to look at energy prices across countries. And it, the dating energy prices, it's like domestic prices and cover Four, type, uh, four different types of energy. And for doing our growth at county, we are going to use the data from GGDC and to, to, to estimate the shares of capital and labor. And lastly, we are going to use the data of the word input output matrix to do the estimations of the capital stock. And regarding just to 
We exclude the two measures, two parts of energy use. One is that the ones that are not used as energy commodity, and we also exclude the residential. So this is the first part of the paper, like the main result, and we show that the energy use uh, per, PP, per PPP GDP, so the energy intensity has a hump shape. So countries that have a low level of development, they use little energy use as they start to develop and they start like being developing countries like China, Brazil, the energy use and the energy intensity increase and as they develop later, like the US, energy intensity starts to decrease. And the size of the ball is the importance in terms of PGDP. So now what we want to do is try to understand what is the importance of sectoral composition, so structural transformation, and what is the importance of actually the technology. So as we know, as we divided this set of countries in four levels of development, where Q1 are the countries that are more developed, and Q4 are the countries that are less developed, what we observe is that the countries that are less developed, they have a larger share of the agricultural sector, as we know from the structural transformation literature. As they develop more, the industrial sector starts to grow. And in the later level of development, service sector is very large. Now, why is this related and why is this important when we talk about energy use? Is because when we look at the differences in energy use across sectors, what we observe is that for low level of developments, the industrial sector has small energy use, and for poor countries in particular, the energy use is very little, they use mostly labor. The industrial sector, we observe that countries that are very developed, they use very little, they use less energy use to generate output. However, the developing countries that are key two, key three, that are the large countries, Brazil, China, and India, their industrial sector, it's not very efficient, use a lot of energy use. And what you observe is that services, by nature, doesn't matter, has very little energy use per PPP GDP. So the first thing that I'm going to do is that I'm going to try to decompose the energy intensity across countries between the energy intensity in this sector and the value added of the sector. And uh, when I do that, uh, for these four levels development, I still have the hump shape. And this is, is the first set of results. And what we observe is that uh, the first uh, column is the energy, is the average energy intensity of this group relative to the US. So 0 0.99 implies that these countries are actually more efficient than the United States. So when you look at energy intensity, the US is not uh, the, the, the most efficient country in energy use. So now when we divide that, what we observe is that when we focus mostly in the Q2 and Q3 groups, that these are where the big emerging economies are, we observe that both the composition of the sectoral is important, explain some of this difference between the, the, the US and this economy, but also the energy intensity of the sector is important. And when we go there and zoom in, in just in the industrial sector, so I'm taking the energy intensity, I'm keeping the value added to the share of each sector, I'm keeping the energy intensity of each sector, and I'm just changing the energy intensity of the sector to the energy intensity of the US, we observe that we already explain, or even more than explain, the differences in energy intensity. So the industrial sector seems to be a very important sector. So what we're going to do is that we're going to look at the industrial sector. Why? Because there is a big debate that maybe why the industrial sector pollute more, is less clean in, as example, China, is because in China they produce more goods that by nature use more energy, okay? So what we're gonna do here is that we're gonna look at the 13 industries and we are decomposing the country level and we wanna try to understand if the differences in the intensity and in the value added of these industrial sectors can explain the differences in energy intensity. So these are all the sectors. And, uh, and in the first graph is the value added of each sector. 
And in the second graph, in the second uh, figure, is the energy intensity of this sector. And what I want you to focus is that, on average, the sectors that are actually inside of the industrial sectors, the sectors that have a high value added are actually the sectors that have a low energy intensity, okay? So when I do the same in the composition, what we observe is that the, if I change the industrial composition of these countries to the industrial composition of the U.S., I do not explain almost nothing the difference in energy intensity. We can see that both the data and the energy intensity with the value added do not change. However, if I just leave the industrial composition, so leave the size of each industrial sector as the same size of the U.S., but change the energy intensity of each sector to the U.S., I get a flat, flat relationship. What does it imply? That I explain most of the differences in energy intensity across sectors. So it's not so much that uh, what is, which sector is producing and which goods are produced in China, but how much, how much actually energy is used to produce the same output inside of the industrial sector. So this is the message of this graph. And this is just showing this number. So now we want to go one step further and try to understand a little bit, OK, what is driving this? Is these differences in price? Is, is, due, is this to differences in overall TFP? Or is this due to differences in the TFP sector? So we build. Uh, this is the standard in this literature, our production function, where uh, Cobb Douglas production function, where we add energy, and we assume that, as it's, it's made from the data, that energy and capital are complements. Then we can do some simple calculations. We have data on prices, we have uh, data from the uh, on capital. We are going to use this data to back up uh, the energy intensity in the US and in the other countries. And uh, we are going to use this data as well to back up uh, the, the productivity using these equations, OK? So which is very standard in the, in the growth and county literature. And then what we want to do is that we want to try to build a contrafactual to understand what if in the other countries they face the US price, and what if they have uh, the technology that is the energy test technology of the US. And these are the results. So first, if they have the US technology in this production function, we already observed that there is no more relation between energy intensity and GDP PPP per capita. So it's gone. So it's mostly all these differences due to, to technology, which is like a TFP. But it's not the aggregate TFP. It's the TFP on this sector. And if we do prices, if we take these countries and put the U.S. price level, we observe that there is some, for some countries, for the low development countries, we would observe lower energy intensity, but for a lot of the high developing countries, for the rich countries, actual energy intensity would decrease because the prices in the U.S. are lower. And here we do again the growth of the composition. So now, since I'm going out of time, just concluding that uh, this is a very simple paper, but what we show is that there is a hump shape in energy intensity. And uh, structural transformation is important, but it's not the whole story. What is really important is these differences in technology. And more important is the difference in technology in the industrial sector. And the prices, at least in the short run, in our simple like, uh, uh, production function model, we can talk about that, they do not play a major role. Could they play a longer role in, in terms of which type of technology you could uh, adopt? Yes, but in the short run, they do not, play, they do not explain much. So what we observe is that there is some technology that uh, the low-income countries and uh, emerging economies uh, are lacking of that make that for them to produce the same amount of output, they just consume a lot of energy. And, uh, okay, thank you. Perfectly on time. So the timing of what you see. Giovanni, we've got five minutes for your uh, immediately give it a yellow card.
So yeah, I, I really uh, enjoy reading this paper and um, let me give the first the main takeaways, at least in my view. Uh, so the, the main contribution, uh, the, one of the main contribution of this paper is that the, the authors document this uh, amp shape relation between energy intensity and income per capita across countries. And uh, uh, so put it differently, middle income countries have the highest energy use per unit of output. Um, and what explains the cross-country differences in energy intensity? Um, basically, all this evidence points to, to two factors. One is energy intensity of the industrial sector, and the second one is uh, sectoral uh, composition, uh, given that uh, countries uh, differ by sectoral uh, composition across the income ladder. And then the main... Um, uh, conclusion uh, of the paper, I think, is that energy saving technology account for most of differences in industrial energy intensity. And given that industrial energy intensity is the most important uh, thing, then, um, then policymakers should uh, focus on this. Um, so, as I said, it's a very, a very nice paper. I liked especially the fact that it's driven by um, a simple data-based approach. It doesn't involve identifying relationships or anything like that. It's basically uh, plotting the data, looking at the data, and uh, drawing conclusions. And then they use a very, stab a very simple and established uh, growth accounting model to, to make some counterfactuals. It has also a clear policy implication that low, and, uh, and, and this is what the, the authors uh, point in their introduction, that low and middle income countries should adopt more energy efficient technologies. Uh, although um, in, uh, in, this uh, uh, in this particular uh, policy implication, I think uh, that the authors should also make an effort to, um, to uh, uh, at least look at the literature and see uh, how costly would that be? I mean, because uh, it is uh, somehow well known that, uh, uh, that um, especially middle income countries sh could adopt uh, like more energy efficient technologies and uh, pollute uh, less. But at the same time, many times these countries claim that this technology would be uh, more expensive and that, uh, uh, that would prevent them from growing at uh, fast rates. And so that is a reason why they don't do that. So, Probably now, um, it, it, uh, I, I would argue that this technology may be a little bit cheaper than they were in the past, so kind of documenting this aspect would give a greater strength to the, to the policy implication of the paper. Um, so, and also, I think that on the motivation part, um, uh, I think that given that you start from this uh, very nice and simple identity, uh, um, uh, that basically splits the problem into two, which is energy intensity and share of renewables. And then you choose to focus on, uh, on energy intensity. Um, so somehow I think that you should do a better job in motivating why. I mean, you present this uh, chart on emission and correlation between emission and uh, energy intensity, but one could also argue, well, if you keep energy intensity fixed and you increase the share of renewables, you would also uh, decrease uh, emissions. So why is it that, uh, that we should prefer one to the other? Um, maybe because one is less expensive than the other, or, uh, but also it may be that one is more effective than the other. So, um, and I think that a step forward could be to try and quantify if uh, these countries uh, get to the frontier as far as energy intensity is concerned, by how much would emission decrease? Uh, and somehow I think that you can build this counterfactual simply by looking at how much, um, uh, how much the countries that are at the frontier emit and, uh, and then 
do a back, uh, back of the envelope calculations to, uh, to do that. I think it would be inexorably um, uh, approximate, but I think it would give uh, um, at least a rule of thumb, rule of thumb type, type of uh, message. And, uh, and also, I would try to say, okay, if a mission would decrease by that much, uh, would it be material? I mean, compared to uh, the goals that, uh, no. that countries have in reducing emissions, so I think that that would give much more strength to the, to the message. And that's it, really. Excellent. Um, then let's take some questions from the, uh, from the, from the floor before, uh, before responding to them. Yeah, please. Uh, again, thank you for another interesting paper. Uh, I have two comments. Uh, one uh, follows Giovanni's comments. Uh, so in your paper, uh, you focus uh, totally on energy intensity, but uh, just looking at recent policy debates, the most important debate is actually as a mix of energy uh, sources. Uh, and I see an easy way where you could just further push on uh, uh, within your paper without major changes. For example, you have a technological component in your production function. You separate capital labor augmentation and energy augmenting technology. So within the energy augmenting technology, you could argue further just by introducing uh, a factor where countries use more renewable or not. The other comment, um, you argue for a hemp shape, and the data also clearly shows that. I think it would be also interesting, apart from this graphical presentation, if you could make kind of an econometric test, you could make uh, a simple uh, quadratic regression, or, no, 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 no. or uh, I could suggest to you another interesting uh, technique. There is a paper on it where you test U or inverse U tests. Okay, thank you. Radek? <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, very interesting paper. So I've got two comments. First of all, I would be um, just a bit sort of careful in drawing out, um, you know, which conclusions you take out from the paper and which you don't. I mean, there is a we know there's a sort of a history of this kind of research going back a few years, including some of my papers, which have sort of looked yeah, at yeah, shaped yeah. energy intensity, the role of structural transformation on energy intensity, the role of prices, and the role of sector energy productivity. But what I see the real contribution here, and this I find very, very interesting, is your third point, the role that uh, uh, differences within the industrial sector play, or as you show, don't play. I think that's a very, very interesting contribution that you know, is very surprising to many, many, many people, um, and will be very interesting to sort of formally uh, document. Uh, the other thing I, I, I know is uh, that this energy intensity data that I imagine you probably, uh, I forget where you get it from, but I guess it's the World Bank or something like that, or it's all the same, EIA. Yeah, um, yeah. They don't uh, measure very well biofuels yeah. and wood fuels. So actually, if you include those, it's not the energy intensity that's a hub shape, it's declining. Uh, energy intensity is not a hump shape, it's declining, it's the modern fuel intensity that's a hump shape. So coal, uh, oil, natural gas, etc. that's what generates the hump shape. Anyway, but very, very interesting stuff. Marina, so I know this paper before, and uh, just uh, one thing on the stylized facts, uh, I think you, you, you probably want to just uh, try or maybe try to distinguish the consumption and the, uh, the industrial use uh, um, of energy, like uh, treat them differently, because the, based on the simple model, you probably don't want to talk too much about the consumption use in the mm -hmm. same paper. So that's one comment. On the other hand, I think uh, in terms of the models and uh, some of the bisexual level uh, analysis, sure. so I wonder if you want to discuss a little bit about the intersectoral linkages, uh, the spillover from different sectors, because uh, um, you asked your input output table, may be dramatically different from developing low-income countries. Yes. Um, if that's the case, sir, so the value added may not be the, you know, the direct measure for those sir, energy use. 
um, even if uh, the value added is low, for example, like iPhone for, United, uh, for China, um, you know, the value added is only 1%, but the high tech may have other implications for different sectors. So um, I think it could be something, it could have a little bit of magnification for some of the things you want to talk a little bit, or maybe try to find a way to address those issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. I was just curious to what extent would you expect uh, this kind of energy efficient technology to actually lead to an expansion in production and therefore no overall change in total emissions? Would you like to respond? Yes, yeah, so let me... Uh, so. Just, you can just go. Okay, <laughs> so let me just respond a little bit. So. Uh, thank you very much, to Giovanni, for uh, your presentation. Yes, regarding these big numbers, like how much it would uh, uh, actually this impact uh, emissions if you improve the technology, how much is this to re renewables? We have done some uh, back and forth calculation, but we, it's true we haven't added to the paper. But I think I will. Uh, I'm going to add it, and I, I have. I always thought that it was important sometimes like to give a little bit of idea of magnitude, like how much you'd be. I think in this debate, people are really looking for numbers that are more tangible than just like presentations. And then regarding the hump shape, yes, in the paper we, we do some regressions and things like that. And, uh, and, we, and it's very, very, uh, the results are very strong, like because we cut the sample, the bottom five percent, the top five percent. The yeah, you go. Yes, we we can we can do more work on that. But I was surprised of how robust it is is actually, and uh, and. Uh, and regarding like the composition of the industrial sector, yes, this is also another thing that we thought that when we start this paper that, uh, oh, this is going to play the major role is coming from the industrial sector. And then we look at the data and it, uh, it's true that 13 sectors is not as narrow as you'd like, but it's like a start. And uh, coming back a little bit to Giovanni point again, is that when I start this project, the question that I want to address was exactly that. So suppose that I take a low income country and then instead of using the energy that it would be cheaper for them, I use the energy that was cleaner. This is how this would impact the structural transformation. It's gonna slow down and how does the increase in maybe in the cost of energy regarding like with your, if your question, Grace, in terms of the interleakage of this economy and this sector, how would affect But I think this was the first step, like, okay, so let me, before I do that, and I do a very a more complicated model and the transition, let me try to understand the facts well, and then I would move. But that's at some point, that's where I'd like to move. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Then I'll give the chair to uh, Giovanni. <laughs> You're right, Sam. So, yeah. Yes. There you go. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, so I'm here to present uh, joint work with my IMF colleague, Monique Niwiak, who's in the African department where I, I used to be. I've now transferred to a different department, but the question that this paper answers is, I think, on the mind of uh, anyone in any department at the IMF, which is, do our economic IMF programs actually help our member countries? And this is, of course, a question that is always very much debated and difficult to determine for at least two problems, I think. The first of all is reverse causality, so countries come to us for a reason, so economic difficulty, so determining whether ongoing economic difficulties are the cause or the effect of an IMF program is non-trivial. 
And secondly, especially in terms of severe economic crisis, it can be very difficult to construct counterfactuals. So think about trying to find a control country for a country that goes through a heavy crisis like Greece and does not seek IMF support. That's just um, not possible. Um, so to address those two problems, we're going to apply a new technique to a new type of IMF program to try and, and, and mitigate these, uh, these difficulties. And the new type of IMF program that we're going to look at was established in, in 2005 and is known as a policy support instrument. And sort of the short uh, Twitter summary is that you can think of it essentially as an I, a traditional IMF programming program but without the financing. So it's a, a non-dispersing program. And as a result of that, it tends to be, um, tends to be requested by uh, developing countries that are not struck by a significant economic crisis, so without a current or prospective balance of payment need, which is a necessary condition for all other traditional IMF programs. But it's basically there to support low-income countries, PRGT eligible countries, um, to ensure stability, sustainability, uh, promote growth, reduce poverty, and, and contain inflation. And as said, the financial arm is not there, so the only main way to reach the program, if it does work, would work, is through the IMS advice, the monitoring, and the, uh, and the sort of seal of approval that it's thought to give. And, and so far, there are, the program has been adopted at various stages by, by seven uh, of our member countries, all located in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, listed there at the bottom. And um, we're going to basically see what those programs have done in those countries. Well, why do we choose to do that? Why do we look at these PSIs? Uh, well, first of all, because it doesn't come with a financial component, with some people worrying about what aid inflows do to a country, does it generate Dutch disease or does it uh, maybe worsen, worsen governance? The, looking at a non-financial program um, sort of kills the financial channel, so we can isolate and see whether there's a specific effect on IMF programs in themselves, just the, just the pure value of IMF advice. And secondly, it reduces the task of, of, of controlling for reverse causality because these countries are, are not uh, struck by an by a, um, acute economic crisis. And as a result, it's easier to, uh, to construct counterfactuals. The way in which we are going to construct these counterfactuals is by this new or relatively new method uh, known as the synthetic control method. And the idea of that basically is, is that you're going to take a treated country and you're not going to treat that treated country against um, individual control countries, but you're basically going to create a weighted average of countries in a, in a potential control group, known as a donor pool, that are uh, not treated over your entire sample period, and you're going to, to select a weight so as to, to match the treated com country as, uh, as closely as possible. So this method was, was already developed in the early 2000s, but really sort of took off around, around 2010 with a second paper by Alberto Abadi and co-authors. And I said the idea is basically to indeed construct for each treated country, in, this, in our case uh, uh, Cabo Verde, Mozambique, Nigeria, and so forth, create a synthetic Nigeria or whatever that matches the real Nigeria as closely as possible along the dimensions that we declare to matter. So we're going to pick countries, control countries and weights endogenously to come as close to the real Cabo Verde as, uh, as possible. And the beauty of the, the synthetic control countries is that, yeah, they remain untreated through, throughout their entire sample period. Um, so at some point, the real country gets treated, the control country remains untreated and any difference is then if you've done things correctly an indication of your, uh, of your treatment effect. Um, so motivated by the objectives of a PSI, we're going to look at three outcome variables, four. We're going to look at real GDP per capita, what does it do to promote growth? We're going to look at CPI inflation, since uh, policy support instruments aim to contain inflation and also reduce, reduce uh, inequality, poverty, and we know that, that Inflation is typically a big contributor to, uh, to inequality since the poor don't, are, not, are the least able to hedge themselves against inflation risk. And finally, to, to sort of get an idea of what an IMF program, what this type of IMF program really does, we're also going to look at the evolution of the capital <laughs> stocks, so both total and, and foreign owned capital. And for each of these three outcome variables, we have to specify covariates that we believe matter. 
um, in terms of um, uh, affecting that particular outcome variable. So if you, for example, take real GDP per capita, well, it's believed to be determined by factors as the investment rate, openness, population density, the structure of the economy, schooling, some measure of institutions for which we use latitude. And, and, and we also include some, some lag variables of the outcome variable to get the sort of shape right in the pretreatment period. And what we're going to do, and the same for inflation and the capital stock, which come with other covariates, is um, we're going to create a synthetic country from a donor pool. So these are all the developing countries, countries as classified by developing, by the, the IMS, we are database, that did not have an IMF program in place at any time over a sample period. And we're then going to ask um, sort of the, the algorithm to say, okay, this is the real Cabo Verde. These are the covariates that we think that matter, and these are the values for Cabo Verde in the pre-treatment period, the average values for all these covariates. So now, from that complete donor pool that you see here, pick countries and pick weights, so that we get a synthetic Cabo Verde that, is as closely, that matches as closely the real thing as possible. And in this case, it is done by taking 43.5% of Eritrea, 23.8% by Bhutan, and so forth. And you see that we match the real Cabo Verde quite, quite closely. And the weight that is placed on each covariate is determined so as to minimize the pretreatment um, uh, forecast error, the pretreatment uh, distance between the two, um, the, 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 between the real and the synthetic country. Um, so yeah, we, you see that in some cases we're sort of spot on. That's when almost spot on. That that's sort of the more uh, the more important cases like tertiary, absolute value of latitude. We're very close, and with others we were sort of somewhat more off. But that's endogenously selected by the um, by the method. And what you get if you then apply it to real GDP per capita is that you indeed see that in the pretreatment period we match the real country pretty closely. In all cases, we sort of get the growth rate right, and, and, and in some cases also the cyclicality. So it, Rwanda is a bit of a difficult case, of course, because they had the genocide in 94, from which uh, they sort of had a, had a bounce back here. But so the, on, the, on the long run, we, we sort of match their average growth rates in the pre-treatment period pretty closely. But then the difference is that the real Cabo Verde and the real Mozambique and so forth get treated at different points in time, namely where the dotted line is drawn. And at that point, the idea is that any divergence between the two lines gives you an indication of the treatment uh, effect. And you basically see that in all cases, so all cases have the exact same regression specification, so there's no picking going on there. But in all cases, we see that the treated country outperforms its, uh, its synthetic control. So there are six countries listed here. The seventh one is Uganda, where we see the, that didn't fit. <laughs> um, uh, where we see the exact same mechanism, so the, the, the treatment and control Komu very closely, then the real Uganda is treated and sort of gets a boost in real GDP per capita growth. And if you calculate the boost, it seems that the boost, it seems that it adds about, on average, I'd say, uh, about a percentage point in annual uh, GDP growth in the, in the medium run. So remember, PSIs were only introduced in, in 2005, so we can't say too much about the, the really long run, but, but this is typically looking at, at, at six, seven, eight years of, uh, of data. And over those years, we find, on average, that the, treated, the actual, the treated countries outperform the control by about a percentage point. Now, you can do the exact same thing for, uh, for inflation. There, we specify different covariates, things that we believe matter for inflation. And indeed, we see in all cases that you see here, um, the pre-treatment tracking of the inflation of the CPI index is very close. Uh, very small, uh, very small errors. But then treatment happens. And you basically see in all cases that the treated, the real countries, um, have a more muted index uh, development of the CPI index than their um, than their uh, than their synthetic controls. Again, suggesting that treatment through an IMF program helps to um, helps to contain inflation. The only exception in this case being Uganda, where we sort of see the exact opposite. Again, the pre-treatment tracking is really good, so that's a, sort of a goodness of fit measure of our, of our um, synthetic control. But there we see that the synthetic control actually has a more muted development of the um, CPI index than actual Uganda. So 
in all these cases, we went back to, to IMF staff reports and, and uh, the reviews of the, uh, of the PSI. And, we need, and, and in this case, in Uganda, around the first review, Uganda is actually the only country that didn't pass its, uh, the first review of its program with the IMF's executive board um, expressing its uh, worries about uh, some amount of monetary financing and loose fiscal policy that was going on in Uganda at the time. And it indeed seems that those worries were warranted because inflation and soon after indeed um, uh, sort of spun out of control a little bit. Um, and on average, in the countries where we do find a, a inflation-reducing treatment effect, we see that it amounts to, on average, let's say about three percentage points. But Uganda had an actual inflation rate post-treatment of 9.1%, while its synthetic control suggests that a rate of 4.8% should have been uh, achievable uh, if they had just um, stick to the previous policies and and, um, and not engaged in the uh, in the monetary financing that we observed back then. So to get a little bit of more feeling for what could be driving these um, these results, um, we also look at so you typically hear the narrative that IMF programs um, uh, catalyze investment, it's, it's a seal of approval. So the first thing we did is. We also looked at what does happen to the total capital stock, on which you have some estimates. And, and there we did, didn't find a, a clear effect. So in some countries, we find positive treatment effects. In others, not really a clear effect. In others, negative. But in all cases, these results, these graphs are rather sensitive in contrast to the other. For inflation and, and GDP, results are quite robust to dropping countries from the donor pool or um, the placebo tests, if you're familiar with this literature, uh, or playing around with different regression specifications, to sort of always, by and large, get sort of results that are, uh, that are consistent with what is summarized in these tables. For, for the capital stock, we don't find that so. So we don't, we don't think that, as a, based upon our results, we can't claim that there's a significant effect on, um, on the total capital stock. But what we find more and more robust evidence for is that um, uh, treatment to a PSI program uh, attracts foreign investment. So the foreign owned capital stock basically goes up in all treated countries uh, except for Tanzania. Senegal, there's something funny going on with the capital stock showing a massive drop here. I, I have to speak to people who know more about Senegal about what could, uh, could cause that. Um, Nigeria, unfortunately, we don't have the necessary data available, but in, in all countries but Tanzania, we find that um, uh, the foreign owned capital stock appears to be boosted. And this could be an important channel through which PSIs deliver, for example, the positive effects on growth, because there's a large literature claiming that um, foreign, foreign direct investment also comes with uh, knowledge transfers, uh, different management practices that subsequently could lead to um, uh, better training, maybe, that could subsequently could lead to, um, uh, to higher growth outcomes. So, some of you might be familiar with an early literature where, where there are some very well-known papers that actually find different results and find that IMF programs hurt growth, increase inflation. So, so what exactly can explain the difference between these early results and, and our more positive results? We sort of see three, three um, possibilities. So first of all, it could be that IMF programs simply improved over time. So most earlier studies looked at um, data before 2000, while the IMF engagements with low-income countries uh, underwent a significant shift through, uh, like starting in 1999 with the adoption of the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, which placed more emphasis on poverty reduction and, and growth. And, and we did a subsample analysis um, with, with different, and we do indeed find that IMF programs seem to become more effective over time, with a break, possible break date being uh, being the year 2000. So I think there's something to story one, that, that we've seemed to become somewhat more effective in, in dealing, engaging with, uh, with uh, uh, lower income countries. Um, then secondly also, what's also a big worry I think, is that these earlier studies all looked at the impact of funded programs. Um, so they had the, the full blown big economic crisis in there, Latin America in the 80s, East Asia in the 90s. Reverse causality there is a much bigger issue as, as discussed before. And it could be that, that there's some residual. They try, of course, to correct for that by using instrumental variables or, or Heckman methods. But it could be that, that some residual effects um, remain, uh, remain present. And then finally, it could also simply be that PSIs are more effective than funded programs. 
as said before, PSIs are mostly applied in, in, in more uh, ca in calmer times as opposed to not in, in crisis times. It could just be that our advice is, is better uh, tailored to the countries in, in more tranquil periods. It could also be that uh, PSIs, as I said before, have only, and are only geared to low-income countries. So it could also just be that our advice is more useful and more apt for, uh, for developing uh, countries. And finally, the presence of, of funding in traditional IMF programs. Some people have expressed worries that, that sort of the large aid flows that it might subsequently also catalyze could induce um, Dutch disease type, effects, type of effects. So this is another potential reason that, that could explain differences between this study and, and earlier works. Um, so I think our findings are sort of, I uh, don't need to summarize them. Obvious remaining questions are, of course, how do these results generalize to uh, the more standard IMF programs that come with funding that are applied to countries with, um, that are in an economic uh, crisis? And then related to that, what is also the exact role of, of financing um, uh, uh, played in these, uh, in these countries? So with that, I'd like to uh, give the floor to my discussion. Okay, thank you. This is a very interesting paper and very relevant. I think I'm a little bit biased to be discussing that, but uh, so I'm going to try to give you a hard time so that everything that you find is extremely robust. But we have this message that uh, actually the IMF uh, help countries. So the, the main question of the, the paper is, do economic programs supported by the IMF, do they harm or do they help countries, no? And this for us is actually very important because at the end of the day, we want to support the membership when, they, when countries go through crisis and we want to help them to, 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 to pass the crisis as fast as possible. So our goal is always to, to, to enhance growth, you know? But it's, we know that the, try to quantify this effect is not easy because uh, we know that there is problems of adverse selection because the countries that are gonna look for programs at the fund are countries that have, uh, are in trouble. And also the reverse causality because you're looking for the IMF because you are, usually have a BOP crisis so you cannot pay your own debt. And uh, there is an extensive literature, and I think Ting did a very good uh, job in the last line in showing that it's, in, I would say, inconclusive, but uh, most, a lot of results are very negative. So what is the, like, how do I say, contribution of the paper is that it looks a little bit of this new instrument that the IMF has developed, uh, that I think he did a good job that it's a non-financial instrument, so you get all this advice, all the mission, all the authorities, all the analysis of the policies that you're doing, but you're not getting uh, the fund, so you're not getting uh, a transfer. And, uh, and this is help to, this program was designed to help these PRGT eligible countries that uh, need more policy advice and sometimes do not have uh, so much uh, uh, capacity and they need more the help of the fund and like this to help this country. So they are around 80 countries and the, the two requirements is that their gross national income is below $1,000 to 115 and they have elite, limited access to financial uh, marketing. So seven countries have own PSI. So one thing, and the, okay, so the methodology, I think you did a very good job explaining it, the synthetic control method. I'm not so familiar, and I think you, like your slides were very good, actually. And, um, and what is key here is that the countries that are, that are, the, the, that, uh, that are in the non-treat countries are countries that didn't have an IMF program. And uh, so the sample are 39 in developing countries and the time period is 92 to 2015. So this is a little bit of uh, discussion. One thing that I think is, is a concern is example, when we're discussing growth, I focus growth because growth is the most, uh, I think, important variable for us. Is that actually in the non-treatment group, we have just uh, six PRGT eligible countries. This is important because uh, like, 
although uh, he showed his sample for developing countries that was large, because the time horizon is so big, like from 19 to, to 2015, a lot of these countries in the 90s, they had an IMF program. So to try to find only the countries that didn't have an IMF program, we had a very small sample of countries. And I think what is a little bit, uh, not uh, like, uh, that could make the paper stronger was if the non-treat countries were more like the PRGT countries, because these countries are similar to the countries that are the treat countries. We want to try to compare like countries that have the same level of development, that they are exposed to the same shocks, that they are passing through the same uh, structural transformation. So one idea would be try to, re but you can reduce the time period. So instead of starting the sample in 1992, focus like 2000 and 2015 just to see if we get the same results and look just for PRGT countries. I think that this would make the paper stronger because these countries are more similar. Another thing is that I don't, I'm not a specialist on this, but one thing that I miss is that, okay, so I don't see like, uh, is this difference that we observe between the treat and, and the non-treat countries that you show, the graphs look very nice, like uh, for the graphs you're convinced, but I don't have a sense of uh, confidence interval, like is this, these two differences, are they statistically uh, significant or not? And I know that you have, uh, uh, from, from your estimations, you have this pre treat standard errors. So I don't know if you could use that and plot that to try to convince uh, like uh, the reader of the paper that actually these two differences that we observe that are striking the graph, I'm not uh, saying that, but that they are actually significant. I think this could make a little bit uh, the paper stronger. And also because uh, like when you decided to include the variables that you decide to include, like if we add more variables that we think that are the ones to be key to, 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 to compare the treat and non -treat treatments, if you could show as well some statistics regarding that would be good. Now one thing that it's a little bit challenging, but this actually, I don't know exactly how to attack this problem, is that uh, why are these countries enrolling in PSI? So if you, start to reading a little bit about this, one criticism that there is is that they actually these countries know that uh, maybe they're gonna be more, that there is a risk that they're gonna have uh, some type of crisis. And once they enroll in PSI, they're gonna be in good shape. And then if they wanna have access to a program at the fund, it's gonna be much easier, much faster, because uh, at the end of the day, they were already have an IMF mission for many years. So. So it's, it's a little bit, uh, I, I think you do a very good job like trying to show that uh, uh, this is, is actually a very good identification, but it, it's hard because you know that some of these countries that had PSIT also actually after end up having program. Mm. And uh, so I, I don't know exactly how we could attack this problem, but I think it's something that we should have in mind, like why is this instrument there? So, but uh, I just want to thank you that say that was a very interesting paper for me being at the fund. It was very good to know more about that. <laughs> and, uh, and I think the results are not only relevant for us, but also for an academia. There is a big debate about why, why is the IMF, is the IMF useful? And I think now in this political environment, this debate is coming back again. But I think just more like a robust exercise could help. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Makes good sense. Please. Yeah, any more questions? Um, Congrats, uh, very interesting paper. Um, my question or comment relates to the adverse selection question. I wonder, I mean, you sometimes use sentences that were like, the IMF advice is useful. There's a very different interpretation to the PSI is just a commitment device for countries that want to do good macro fiscal policy and you know, invite the IMF to hang out once a week or twice a year for a week. But like, they're not the actual advices that drive the reforms, it's, it's somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder what you think about yeah. uh, that kind of interpretation. And then the second one is exactly uh, what came out in, in, uh, in the comments from Marina is, 
there is this transitioning in and out of IMF programs. You choose the one that suits you. It's faster to jump between them once you're in the game. Uh, so there might be longer dynamic effects. Like your choice is not just the PSI, you're opting for this range of programs. So I wonder how this... Like you don't yeah. have one treatment, you actually have a line of future treatment, thinking about future treatment. Yeah. So that complicates things. Yeah. So I'd be curious on that. Okay. Uh, maybe jumping the queue here, but can I just follow up on exactly that point? I think this um, adverse selection issue is, is, is central here. Um, and I had a slightly different take on it. So you talked about a, a commitment device. Um, suppose you, you're sitting there and you know um, that there's a prospect that, that fundamentals are looking good. Um, there's a difference between um, well, there are two things I, I want to say. One is, you're talking about the presence of these PSIs. I suppose what's interesting is the transition from some other program to uh, a PSI, rather than just the, the existence of it. So it, it's a kind of a graduation mechanism. And the second, in terms of timing, is the, is the kind of endogenous placement of that, of that program. At what point is it advantageous for a country to engage in a PSI in anticipation of securing third-party funding, either private FDI flows or other forms mm -hmm. of capital inflows uh, that will sustain this anticipated shift in the fundamentals. Because if it's a pure advice effect, then wow, this is a valuable institution that we're talking about. If you can get that level of, of medium-term growth off advice, that's pretty good. Good, yeah, good like to immediately respond to this point, I think it's a very, very relevant, good point, and I, I do indeed think that the the seal of approval plays a role, and 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 maybe also that it makes things easier for authorities to to get things done if there's an IMF backing it, and I think that's that's just to have an institution there, even if it wouldn't do something that you can point to, and and motivated by might already help in itself. Yeah. Uh, so, you find that the effect on aggregate capital stock is just negligible or there is no effect, but you also find that FDI increases. But aggregate capital stock is maybe domestic investment plus FDI, yeah. which what you are saying in a, in a sense is the program decreases domestic capital investment. You didn't emphasize that, in the, which is saying the program hurts in some sense, right? So what, what, what is the explanation in that? And, uh, because I, I think it's hidden in the, in the, in the, in the, in the presentation. Mm. Um, hi, Tim. Um, related to the first two questions, the way I had thought about it was in terms of conditionality. Now, there's a big literature that aid conditionality doesn't work. And your results are essentially building on that and, and saying, well, with these PSI programs, there is no conditionality in the same sense. You can't withdraw the advice, whereas with money you can. And so this is just a, the reason it seems to be so effective is that you're just aligning the incentives of the donor effectively, the IMF, with the, um, with the country. Yeah, this one at the Hi, thank you. Uh, so, uh, just a few questions about the technique. So, uh, just answering Marina's question about confidence, uh, confidence intervals, I think you can use a different diff model, and this is used in the synthetic control literature, and this can uh, like solve the issue of uh, statistic significance. Uh, now, about the technique, so, uh, so one assumption about the, the SEM is that the control country should not be impacted by the shock, that's true but they also shouldn't be impacted by any other exogenous shock that's not related to economic activity. And in your sample, you're including countries like Lebanon that was impacted by the conflict with Israel in 2006, or I think Iran. So can you, you can just make like a robustness, I'm not sure if you did it or not, but one possibility is to do a robustness check and remove all, any of these countries that were impacted by these shocks and see how the results uh, go. And uh, what was the rationale using like your GDP as a covariate of only 1995, 2000, and 2005? Because I noticed that in the literature they use the whole pre-sample period or like they use different averages. 
And one other thing is that to minimize any omitted variable bias, you should make your pre-sample period longer. So if you look at the Abadi paper, it's, they start from 1960. So uh, just like some robustness, I think this would uh, make the paper uh, more robust, but I think it's a very interesting result. Thank you. <laughs> please feel free if people want to leave to a different session then, then please go but yeah I won't be offended yeah, yeah just uh, a quick uh, note uh, uh, yeah in synthetic uh, control uh, coming up with uh, a, a very good uh, control is uh, very important with, res with regards to this and with the fact that a lot of uh, uh, these countries share structural similarities why didn't you consider uh, institutional uh, variables? Like it could be CPIA or uh, world governance indicators mm -hmm. as uh, additional uh, covariates. Thank you. Think, do I need to, yeah. uh, how are we doing on time? The, uh, the last question ah, okay, and then, and then yeah. we address. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, uh, I noticed your PSI is all Africa, whereas your control group is mostly non-Africa. Mm -hmm. This was a super good de decade for Africa. Actually, 2016 looks very different for a lot of the countries you have in the sample. Could there be something between Africa versus non-Africa and the whole regarding yes. some of the results? No. Okay. <laughs> so very quickly on uh, the standard errors, confidence intervals is a, is a very good point. So that's something that with the, the method itself hasn't fully addressed yet, but you can do what we do in the paper is are these placebo tests. So you can basically pretend that a non-treated country, pretend that it was actually treated, and sort of get a sense of how big is the actual treatment effect relative to the placebo effect. So that gives you some, but in our case, numbers are too small to derive proper p-values from it, but that would be the way to do it. But in our case, it's, it's, not, um, it's, not, uh, it's not possible due to simply the numbers. Uh, yeah, we, we addressed the adverse selection point. I do indeed think that just having an institution there that you can point to might help. Um, Good point about the substitution between domestic and, and foreign investment. That might indeed be um, be um, uh, like a pink thing to point out, and, and, and might be a way through which it works. Also, if foreign direct investment indeed comes with with better management practices or whatever, or training, or that might uh, that might be helpful. On conditionality, um, yeah, indeed, we, we don't have with PSIs. We don't have the money that we can threaten to. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to put on hold, but countries do still, to keep the seal of approval, countries do still want to pass their PSI reviews. So in that sense, countries do still, as said, there was only one country, which was Uganda, that uh, didn't, uh, didn't, uh, didn't make a review. And so it seems that countries are still eager to keep the IMF involved and to keep their sort of PSI stamp, stamp on there. So there is conditionality in the programs and there, there are, uh, we also summarize that a little bit in the paper. Um, in terms of, of your point on the why don't we all include all uh, pre, the entire pre-sample period for the for the uh, for the uh, dependent variable? So there's recently a paper arguing that that's actually wrong and that it's, if you include all individual pre-treatment years, all the other covariates become irrelevant, which is not uh, essentially what you want. Like the ref we reference the paper in the paper, so that's motivates our reason to, to move to a subset, which is the recommendation of that paper. Um, institutional variables, one thing um, um, that is important in applying the synthetic control method is that you ideally shouldn't include variables as covariates that are directly affected by treatment, uh, while institutional variables could be directly impacted. So we, we proxy institutional uh, variables by, by latitude, for example, which is something that's clearly exogenous and not affected by treatment. Um, so that's our sort of proxy for that. But I agree, ideally, you would want to include the CPIA or, or Polity 2, but they might be directly affected. Uh, by, but we do show in a robustness check that it doesn't really um, affect our results, but it's... So, so that, that, that's basically what we, what we do through the, um, we do it in a robustness check, but like from a purely econometric point of view, uh, people might, uh, might object to that. Um, and then a final point on, on African countries. Um, yeah, we are of course limited by the, uh, by the amount of available countries, also relating to the very valid point that some countries in there are not PIGT eligible. Um, but on that I'd say that 
at the end, sort of what matters, I think, are the whatever covariates you specify. So if we specify the correct covariates, it would still be possible to take non two, two, two non-PIGT eligible countries and pick a weighted average that, if it were a country, would PIGT eligible. So in that sense, I think that the synthetic control method is a, is a nice way to, to maybe uh, bridge, those, uh, bridge those gaps. Um, so I think these were all the questions that I, uh, that I uh, took note of. So I don't know, I'll take my, my sort of chair roll again, but if there are still any comments or questions on one, some of the previous papers, very urgent or otherwise, just um, feel free to come up to us bilaterally. But in any case, thank you very much for, uh, for your attendance in this session and all your very helpful questions and comments and for your discussions as well and presentations. So thank you very much for that to you all. Thank you.